All right, so we are in section two, lesson six this morning. The next to the last one in the sections that you have, and I am frantically working on section three and should have it in your hot hands next week uh, so that you can add it to... Uh, the good news is it's a short section. It only has three lessons in it, okay? And then section four is going to be a book. <coughs> So we'll do that one in. We'll do sections of, anyway, not, not important at this point. How many of you have children? Most of you have children? Okay. Well, as we're kind of getting started today, think about when your child or your children were born. And what, was, what would you say was uh, some of the significant things that changed in your life after the birth of a child? My sleep. Sleep, yeah. that's a big one, isn't it? Yeah, what else changed for you? Well, I didn't realize that it's a different type of love you have for your child, and I didn't mm. realize how much God loved me until I felt that love for my child. Mm. Mm. No, that's cool. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, what else? turn your marriage on its head too because the relationships are just, you know, you're not just all about each other anymore. You know, you've got this other little attention sucker. <laughs> Otherwise known as Reed. <laughs> I don't want to get specific here, but you know, I could recommend a good counselor for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that? Attention sucker. <laughs> okay. I think that says it all, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, ch they, it's a game changer when we have kids. I mean, our whole world changes. Our sleep, our eating, uh, our emotions, everything changes. I think sometimes when we, when we consider the birth of Jesus, though, because of the, the ramifications of who he is, that oftentimes a lot of the human elements of that, somehow we, we don't see them in the same way. And yet Mary and Joseph were dealing with the same kinds of upheaval. Uh, we've, we've tried to, to delve into their story a little bit <clears throat> to kind of, to get a sense of it. Of course, uh, you know, first century life was radically different than what we're dealing with in terms of even marriage. Even marriage. I mean, they weren't uh, technically they were they were not married. You know, they were still in that you know uh, situation where uh, uh, and and so it's it's a uh, there's just a lot of there's just a lot of things that they were dealing with culturally that added additional pressure to them. I mean, it was one thing to have a child and everything socially to be just, you know, uh, right, you know, so to speak. And, uh, and yet we have this story going on. So it's, it's, uh, it's different. So what we have this morning, as we look into this, this is the, we're, we're nearing the end of Luke chapter 2. We, of course, we studied about the birth of Jesus last week and uh, hopefully, you know, saw some good things from that. Uh, today, we're going to look at the, the section that is his, that has to do with his uh, naming, his circumcision, uh, and the presentation that is made uh, by his parents on behalf of him in the temple. So let's look at this. This is kind of a long section uh, on the front page of your notes. And it says, On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law uh, of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord 
and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. <clears throat> now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the, the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simea blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, the, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel, or Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. Now, You'll notice there are several references in this section about uh, doing things according to the law of the Lord. Now, this might be a very obvious question, but let me ask you. Why was that of particular interest to them to do things according to the law of the Lord? They were Jewish. They were Jewish. Okay. What's that? I mean, Jesus was there, but he wasn't. I don't know. Yeah, he's kind of, he's kind of, yeah, it's weird. Who is Jesus? God's son. He's God's son. What is the, what is the, the, <clears throat> notice verse 26 about what Simeon said. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's who? Messiah. He is Messiah. And the reason that there is such great attention paid to the, the law of the Lord, talking about the Old Testament law, is because the, the Messiah was one who was going to be coming from Israel, from the people of God. He was going to be, that's what the, uh, we haven't got to the genealogy yet, but that's part of what the, the genealogy is about. And, uh, and so forth. To establish him within this system, God is working, as we've been pointing out, telling a story from the very beginning of Scripture all the way through till the end. And this part of it needs to fit with it. He is Messiah. And so all of these things are being done, which will accentuate our understanding of him as Messiah. Let's look at a few of the things that uh, they did. First of all, they circumcised the child. That was always done on the eighth day. And so we, that's why the reference is eight days after he was born, he was brought to the temple and he was circumcised. Now, it was not always common for them to wait and to name the child on the eighth day. That was not necessarily a requirement, but that is what they did. And you'll notice that it's a name that does not correspond with a family name, like we went through the whole thing with, remember Elizabeth and Zechariah, and his name's going to be John. That's, that's not a family name. Okay, so same kind of a thing going is, is going on here. 
So circumcision had to do <clears throat> with when God established the Old Testament covenant with Abraham, Abram, Abraham, what he did was he required that all of the men go and be circumcised. And this was going to be a sign of the covenant. That was just something that you did. All of the males, when they came into uh, the family, so to speak, the family of Israel, they were circumcised. Okay. Now, that uh, still goes on today, by the way. Okay, that is a very much a part of, of that. Now, but that's not the only thing going on here, is it? We find out that there's some other things going on. Uh, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, they took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written. Now, what we have going on here is, uh, is oftentimes confused because there are actually two presentations that would take place, and we only have one of them because the other one really isn't all that important to the telling of Jesus as Messiah. One of the things that would have happened in, uh, in fact, I think I made a couple of notes about this on the back side <coughs> of this sheet. Uh, yeah, on the, on, in the section, Into the Word, Verses 21 to 24 are describing two different events that would have happened at two different times. Uh, the purification rites would have taken place 40 days after the birth, unless the birth is a girl, and then that time doubles. Okay? All of this is prescribed, it is written down in the book of Leviticus chapter 12. So if you want to do a little bit of research about what this is about... Now this had this the purification rites had to do with uh, uh, you know Mary essentially because this is what happened this is what was required for a woman to do after she had given birth okay because of the presence of blood and other things that took place obviously in a childbirth right that made her unclean. And so there was a period of time that she would have to wait and then she would come to the temple and uh, go through another thing that we're going to learn about later on. You're going to hear about something called a mikvah, mikvah, okay? That's a ceremonial washing that took place, a ceremonial washing. Put that in the back of your brain for later, okay? A ceremonial washing, a mikvah. Okay, but, uh, and then they would come and they would bring a sacrifice depending on uh, your station in life, how, what your, what your economic standing was. Uh, they actually brought a pair of doves or two young pigeons, which actually meant that they were poor. They didn't have the means to give a more elaborate sacrifice, which I believe would have been a lamb. Uh, but, but the law provided for those with less, lesser means to have these uh, items as that which they would uh, to you as a sacrifice. Now, but look at verse 23, because we come across a word here that really needs to get our attention. In fact, I would encourage you to underline this word. It is the word consecrated. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. Now, what that means is that every firstborn male was actually supposed to become, when we're saying consecrated, that means that they were a gift. You know how we give the first tenths of what we have to the Lord. We call that a what? A tithe. Okay. And when uh, parents are having babies, the firstborn son is consecrated to the Lord. That is something that, uh, that's just, that was just something that was a part of the Old Testament law. Now, uh, your son would be consecrated to the Lord, but it was possible that if, for whatever reason, you wanted to buy your son back, so to speak, or redeem your son, uh, you could do that for, I believe it was five shekels or something like that. The, the scripture actually talks about that. But you'll notice something about this one. 
Did they buy him back? Did they redeem him? Did his parents redeem him? Do you see any changing of money here? Read about it? No. Well, what does that mean then? What, is, what does one who is consecrated to the Lord expected to do? Yeah. They are the, a servant of the Lord. This is a part of, you know, uh, like if, if, uh, if you had a son and you were in a business, right, where you, uh, you know, you could really use that son's help in that particular business, right? You would oftentimes redeem that son so that that son could then become a part of what you were doing, okay? Uh, but oftentimes, you know, either people couldn't afford to do that or whatever. Now, in the case of, of others, uh, there are examples, uh, for example, Samuel in the Old Testament. He was the firstborn. He was consecrated. And he actually, you know, lived as a consecrated person. Okay, but consecrated is another way of emphasizing the fact that Jesus is special. And then we get into, um, we get into Simeon, who is uh, a prophet, and he was very devout. And notice this, he is waiting for something called the consolation of Israel. That's another phrase that... that this is an Old Testament phrase. That's a phrase from the Old Testament. It is referring to the, the Messiah, to the one who was going to bring about all the things that God had promised Israel. The consolation. What is consolation? That's constellation. Consolation. Here in the South, there could be either one, right? There it is. What's that? Make it right. you, okay, it's, it could be the making of things right. If, we can, if we're going to console someone, what are we doing? We make them feel better, don't we? This is, this is essentially God's answer to the people of Israel. You know, they, they are his people. They're living in covenant, but they were in rebellion, and they'd gone through all kinds of things from enslavement to living in exile, and now Jesus, the Messiah, is going to be the consolation. He's going to be the setting of things back right. He is going to be the consoling of them, of, of you know, helping them. And, and so that's what this guy is looking for. That's what he had been told by the Holy Spirit was going to happen. And so when, they, when he, he is uh, in the presence of Jesus... All of a sudden, he realizes what's going on, and he begins to prophesy again by the Holy Spirit, saying all of these things about Jesus. Now, Luke is including all of these. Well, let me add that. Why do you think Luke is including all of these references in his telling of the story of Jesus? It certainly makes it a better story. Yeah, it's confirming truth. It is, uh, it, is, it, it is giving a lot of great texture to the story. It's giving us a lot of, of uh, references and things that we can, that can be utilized, you know, to, to confirm things and, and see how things were done. It's, uh, it's, it's really, I think he just does a really good job. Now, notice again, back to what Simeon is saying, uh, go down to verse 29. Uh, he takes the child in his arms and praises God saying, verse 29, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. What does that mean? Dismiss your servant in peace. You can die. You can die. It's okay, Lord. I'm ready to go now. Okay? He, he, the promise has been fulfilled. You said I wouldn't die until I saw the consolation of Israel. I have seen the consolation of Israel. And now I'm ready to go. And so he says that very publicly. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Now, what is the salvation of the Lord? This again is something that needs our attention 
because oftentimes when we understand salvation, we have, we have boiled it down to a definition that isn't nearly as broad as it needs to be or as, or as understood as it should be strategically. Let me show you what I mean. What is that salvation? Verse 30 and 31 and 32. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of only one nation. Right? No. All nations. Who is salvation for? It's for all nations. Now, wait a minute. This is prior to Jesus. You know, obviously his ministry. We, we're just getting kicked that, kicking that off, aren't we? He hasn't been uh, crucified yet. He certainly hasn't been resurrected yet. And yet in the Old Testament, with respect to Israel and what the purpose of Israel was, had to do with the salvation of the entire world. Okay, this is often lost on many people, in, uh, particularly in the 21st century, 20th and 21st century, when we think about what is salvation about. Okay, oftentimes when we think about it, we think about it in terms primarily as the relationship that I have with God. And that is certainly true. That is a part of it. But part of the reason that you have been blessed to have heard the gospel message in order to respond to the gospel message is so that just like them, which we're going to find out in a moment, that gospel message is supposed to go through you out to others so that the salvation will continue to take place. You and I, in fact, are agents of the salvation of God. But see, I think for a lot of us in the church, it's like, okay, I'm saved, you know, big checklist off my list, you know, and now, now what do I do? Okay, well, just like for them, and that's why we need to understand how this all worked for them uh, in, in the Old Testament. Uh, it was prepared for all nations. Notice what's right after the word nations. What is that, those two dots? A colon. You know what that means? It is an explanation for what was just said. The salvation which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. Here it is. This is, this is a strategic, this is God's strategy for salvation. A light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of of your people, Israel. What does that mean? That means that Israel from the get-go, in fact, the promise that was made to Abram, you know what, when he, he, he got his name changed, didn't he? To Abraham. You know what the difference between Abram and Abraham is besides the number of letters? What does Abram mean? What does Abraham mean? Abram means a father. Abraham means father of many nations. That's his name. That is God's intention to have this people set apart people. Why? So that he could, he could say, these are my favorite people and these are better people than everybody else and everybody else is kind of just... No, no, no. You see, the purpose of Israel has always been to be the means by God would shed his grace and his glory and they would then live out that covenant before the rest of the world and the rest of the world would then be drawn to that and receive that salvation, that they would be what it is, a light of, for revelation to the Gentiles. And that they would be that they would experience this glory, the glory of your people, Israel, because they were doing what it is that God had created them to do. To be this light, to be this the means of the entire world experiencing salvation. 
So this is, this is what's going on. We see salvation coming. What are the implications of that for us today? Who does God want to be in his family today? Everybody. Okay. You believe that? Okay. Have you seen everybody? I mean, there's some train wrecks out there, right? I mean, present company excluded, of course, but, you know, there's some train wrecks out there. Who are, who are some of the train wrecks? Who would you consider a train wreck? Remember, you can't see anybody in the room. So who's a train wreck? <laughs> I'm thinking more groups as opposed to individuals, by the way. <laughs> who are some of the train wreck groups that we're going to have a hard time accepting them as a part of the body of Christ? <laughs> Right. Universalism. That's a train wreck. That's a train wreck. Yeah, people. Yeah, people people who uh, people who refuse to uh, acknowledge the exclusivity that Jesus is the Christ, that he is the Messiah. That's the bottom line. I mean, you can't be a, in my opinion, you can't be a Christian without that. I mean, that's, that's about as nuts and bolts as it gets. Okay, who else are going to be a train wreck? Well, I guess you have the atheists. Anybody, anybody, uh, uh, what, what, about, what about people of Islam? What about them? Is that a train wreck? I mean, <laughs> that's a big one. Yeah, why is that a big one? Yeah. Well, they. They. Well, actually, they're they're not anti Jesus. If you, uh, they actually believe in Jesus. They claim. But but they don't believe that he is Messiah. Okay, that's a, they believe that the, the prophet is Muhammad. Okay, he is, he is the prophet. Okay, um, and, you know, but many Muslims are very familiar with, the, you know, the Gospels and the storyline of the Gospels. They just tell them in a different way, and they, they see the conclusions that are drawn in radically different ways. But... Uh, you know, because of the, because that, because there is sometimes, uh, sometimes there is violence attached to what people of that faith are doing in order to enforce that faith or to try to usurp, you know, to, to, you know, assert themselves within that faith. That is problem. And, and yet, just as sure as I'm standing here, I know that the Lord wants them to be in his family. Now, that's, that may be hard for you to accept, okay? But it, it's true. He wants all people. He died for all people. If they're humans, then he died for them. Uh, there may be people from other ethnic groups that give us a challenge, other races, uh, other, you know, kind of philosophical points of view, whether it's atheism or universalism or, uh, you know, whatever, whatever that is. And uh, it creates, it creates a, a lot of challenges for the body of Christ to figure out how are we supposed to model Jesus Christ for them. That is hard. That's a hard one. To think about, uh, and it's it's one that that the church needs to wrestle with. Uh, there are there are people within our own community. Does does uh, does the Lord want everybody in Itawamba County to be in His family? Most most of the people from Itawamba County, He wants in there His family. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what that means, right? That means that you know. 
there's some there's some people that may be it may be challenging for us to to accept that you know the fact that I mean because why because there might be history there might be issues of of things in the past and so forth that that happened perhaps prior to Christ and uh, but are there is there anybody really in Etiwamba County to reach out to do you think well if you don't think so, you need to go read my blog, okay? How, did any of you read that? Okay, no liars. Okay, thank you, Karen. God bless you. Okay. Uh, what, what, I, what I wrote about, and, and I'll just mention this in passing, but what I wrote about was the fact that uh, a lot of us are under the mistaken, uh, the mistaken thinking that uh, especially as we're being encouraged to reach out for friend day, to reach out to somebody and invite somebody to church, a lot of us are, are under the mistaken uh, thinking that everybody or most everybody in Etiwamba County either is a Christian or is already connected to a church in some place else. And I had this pointed out to me by a fellow who is actually doing church planting in the state of Mississippi. And he pointed out from the 2010 census, which of course that's not even the most recent census, right? But that's the one that we've been working with until recently. According to the last 2010 census, 58% of people in Etiwamba County are, do not identify as followers of Jesus or don't have any affiliation at all. 58%. Now, you know what the population of Etiwamba County is, according to 2010? If you know this, you are a nerd, okay? Or you read the blog, because I, I think I did put the, the number in the blog. How much? For the whole county. 23,500, something like that. So 58% of 23-something is like 13,000 people, over 13,000 people, over 13,000 people right here in Etiwamba County. So if you were thinking about in a couple of weeks coming to church and saying, well, Brother Tony, I wrecked my brain and I couldn't think of anybody to bring to church, I would say, uh, I'll save you the embarrassment, okay? Because even, even I have found people in Etiwamba County who don't go to church, and have invited them to church. Okay, so uh, you know we can we. In other words, the, there's a whole lot of people out there that we could be reaching out to, and what? Why? Because as hopefully you're hearing, the the reason that God created Israel was not just to say that we like you and you're special. It was to say, you are the blessed people of God who are going to be the vehicle through whom the salvation of the entire world comes. Guess what? The church has been tasked now as the new Israel to be the vehicle, according to the Great Commission, to take the gospel message to all corners of the globe. That's our mission. And part of that globe includes Etiwamba County. And so these are, this is a part of, of, uh, of our responsibility. So important to, to see that. Now, let's go on here quickly. Uh, we've, we've run into Anna. Anna's kind of a cool lady, isn't she? She's uh, 84, hanging out in the temple all the time. Yep, okay. And, uh, you know, she... Verse 38, coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. There it is again. You see, the redemption, the buying back of Jerusalem. Jerusalem <coughs> representing there the temple. That's where the temple was, the center of Israel. And now the, the part by which God is going to use his uh, ministry to go forward. So uh, the, these are incredibly uh, important parts. Notice the, uh, on, again, on the back of your sheet, it says applying the word. 
The phrase in verse 38, the redemption of Jerusalem, is often seen narrowly, thinking about it only in terms of the city of Jerusalem. But how would the redemption of Jerusalem impact all of Israel as well as the entire world? How would it infect all of Israel? Let's start there. The redemption of Jerusalem. What's in Jerusalem? It's bigger than a bread box. Uh, well, it's in the, the place I'm talking about. The what? The temple. That's the seat of their, their religion, their faith. That's where, that's where the glory of the Lord was supposed to show up, remember? Okay, so this is, this is a part of, of what's going on. But remember what we also found out? Remember what we said last week about the glory of the Lord? Where did the glory of the Lord show up? Not in the temple. In the fields. In the fields, to the angels. Whoa, that's, at a, that's crazy talk right there. I mean, that's just mm, landmark kind of stuff. Okay, so the bottom one, where do you see yourself, the present day world in this story? How has hearing the repetition of the scope of the kingdom caused you to rethink your own views of kingdom? And uh, hopefully you're, you're starting to, uh, you know, I don't know if, if, you, if you're a person that finds it easy to put yourself in a story. Are you able, do, can you do that? Can you, can you put yourself in a story? Now, you might say, well, <clears throat> this story is already done, so it's going to be kind of hard for me to put myself in the story. But is it done? Is it done? <clears throat> Apparently not, because there's still more that's spoken about in other parts of the Scripture that say that there's more to come, right? In fact, that's what we're going to be talking about in church again this morning, about the more to come and what's the next thing that is supposed to be coming. Okay, so we do find ourselves as players in this grand story, just as these people do. Now, obviously, the role that we play is going to be dramatically different, okay? The roles of Mary and Joseph have already been cast, right? All of those, all of those have been done. That is history, verifiable as we're finding out. I mean, that should give us great confidence as well. But now, as the story goes forward, you and I should find ourselves in the story, in the lineage. We are a part of that. Because somewhere down the line, for generation after generation, the gospel has gone forward and gone forward and gone forward. And someplace, the same Holy Spirit who is speaking to them spoke to your heart and you said, I believe and I need Jesus. It's the same spirit. Now, there may not be a book like this written about your life. But there is a book that is being written about your life. Have you heard of that one? The Lamb's Book of Life. There is a book that's being written about your life and my life too. And your life is, is telling a story of the legacy, the continuing on of what's going on here. It is, it is cool. So let me just challenge you. Maybe this week, maybe as you're, you're thinking, uh, you know, how, how can I see myself more in the story? As I begin to understand more of what the story is about, that this isn't just about a baby and a being born in weird times and about weird events happening. This is actually about the God who created the world taking his story to the next place Oh, and there's more to come. And he's invited me to be a part of that, to play a role in that story. That's what's going on right now. So I would, I would encourage you to see yourself in the story and readily embrace that as you go forward. All right? Cool. It's good to, good to be able to talk. Next week, we're going to uh, continue uh, by looking at... Uh, a section, again, that's often, we kind of just blow by it. It's the part about Jesus growing up. He goes to the temple and his parents get ticked off at him and blah, blah, blah. You know that story? Yeah. 
You never get mad at your kids, do you? No? Okay, well, there's always time. Okay, anyway, why don't we, why don't we stand up and uh, go forward? And now, Father, as we uh, come to a close, I just pray that you would bless us as we have heard these things. I pray that we would uh, catch a, a greater sense of the magnitude of the story that we're looking into. And as we peel back the layers, I pray that it would just wash over us in ways that, that challenge our thinking and challenge our heart. Father, give us a clear vision for where we fit into your story. And help us, give us the resources that we need to be able to, to better understand it and then uh, just in response to your grace and the, and the wonderful gift that you've given us to commit our way to you, to consecrate our way before you as your servants. However that looks, in, in a variety of roles, always carrying forward your purpose to be a light to those who do not know you. Now be with us as we prepare for worship. Help us to, to gather well in your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.